Halo. A game that started off its development as an RTS with the codename Monkey Nuts, which eventually turned into a third person shooter named Blam, to eventually what it would become which is what it's known for now, which is a first-person shooter called Halo. And then Microsoft wanted Bungie to change the name, so they added Combat Evolved to it. While Bungie knew it would be a hit, they didn't think it would be as big of a hit as it has been. They made it with the thought it would be a one-time thing, but it eventually spawned Halo 2, Halo 3, Halo 3 ODST, and Reach, at least when it came to Bungie. But before Reach, Another Halo game was added into the mix to where it would make Halo come full circle. Halo Wars. Except it wasn't created by Bungie, but instead created by Ensemble Studios. Ensemble Studios. Creators of the Age of Empire games, Age of Mythology games, and Star Wars Galactic Battlegrounds were bought out by Microsoft back in 2001. After a decade of making a lot of RTS games, the team felt burnt out making RTS games, so they started four prototype projects. Wrench, a prototype third-person car combat game which had a graphics and physics engine technology demo made for it. A sci-fi Diablo clone called Nova, which was essentially Diablo in space, an MMO with the code name Titan or Orion. It should be noted that games that they make that weren't RTSs generally didn't end up finishing, like BAM, which is a Ratchet and Clank style game, Sorcerer, which was a fantasy RPG game, and Agent, which had an art style and universe inspired by Pixar's The Incredibles, and gameplay elements from Tomb Raider. The fourth prototype project was called Phoenix, which was an RTS game, but for consoles. The premise of this RTS game would be Earthlings vs Martians in a War of Worlds style conflict. The start of the project was initialized by Angelo Loudon, who was working on a prototype of Age of Mythology that could be played with an Xbox controller, and proved that Age of Mythology could be played using a controller without too much friction. Wrench eventually gets cancelled, but they start prototyping Nova, Phoenix, and Titan. The lead of Phoenix was Graham Devine, and with a team of 25 people, they started working on a control scheme, which ended up taking them around 12 to 18 months. Once they were happy with it, they took it to Microsoft, and Microsoft suggested it to be turned into a Halo game. In an interview with Tony Goodman, who was the studio head, said, I think it was Peter Moore who was the head of Microsoft Xbox before Don Matrick, but Microsoft was pretty risk averse and they said, I don't know if we want to take the risk of creating strategy games on a console. We'd feel better if Halo were attached to it, which makes sense. Most people won't buy into a new IP without prior attachment, like a beloved developer or a franchise. Well, yes, they've made games that guarded well with those who played it. But those games were on a different platform. All have been on PC, but of course. Why don't you just paint over what you have with Halo stuff? Or were it so easy? Were it so easy? Having to create a game for a platform they haven't worked on. On a genre that's better played on a PC. Rich Geldrich and Billy Khan ported the Age of Empires 3 engine to Xbox 360, which worked, but it ran at like 3 to 8 frames, and it takes 5 minutes to load. It really hammered home that the engine wouldn't work, but for Halo Wars, it was written from the ground up. Except for a few things, like pathing came from Age of Empires 3, and the core engine and renderer came from Laura Fryer's MS ATG. Once they accepted making the game, they visited Bungie, the creators of the Halo franchise. And it didn't start off well. A quote from Tony Goodman saying, And another problem was that Bungie was never up for it. But Bungie was kind of sore about the idea. What they called it was the whoring out of the franchise or something. Yeah, that didn't create a great relationship between us and Bungie. They viewed us as someone infringing on their franchise. 
but it wasn't all doom and gloom. They were, I think, a little bit surprised at how, this is kind of a hard thing to explain, uh, how, how well we got Halo. You know, um, I think yeah, they've got all the, the little axioms that they've developed over the years, you know, the, the 30 seconds of fun and, you know, the, being able to throw your grenades, you know, manually is a very, very important thing. And, you know, to hear them talk about Halo, it's a rifle and grenades. When I don't think maybe necessarily every player perceives it that way or uses grenades nearly as much as, as it's part of a lore for the, for the bungee guys. Um, I think they were really happy uh, when we, quote unquote, figured out how to do the Y abilities. Um, we don't like you know, we don't talk about failures in the development process much, but one of the things we uh, did was we implemented Y abilities uh, really early on in the project, and it turned out to not be very fun. <laughs> and so they, they got they got yanked out of the game entirely. Um, and uh, when I took over as lead designer, um, we, we we cut some other features to make sort of player bandwidth and and room for the Y abilities to come back. And like that was when we we really kind of hit the Halo vibe was having Marines that shot, but then I can throw grenades. Right. And when, when we had that, I think Bungie got really happy with, you know, um, kind of us demonstrating that we really understood Halo. I mean, you know, Graham worked with them, uh, Graham Devine, our lead writer, uh, worked with them a lot on the story and Joseph and things like that. Uh, yeah, I think like anybody who sees their baby kind of taken and changed by somebody else, you know, they were uh, uh, very constructive in terms of the criticism, but also, I mean, they, they were awesome. They were very helpful all the way throughout and um, I think probably something that I'm not sure we could have done for somebody who used our IP once they 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 understood that we got it they trusted us and really kind of left us alone which I give them a lot of props for that was uh, that took a lot of maturity on their part to, to kind of let us go our own way and you know we added a ton of stuff to the canon just to, to flesh out a strategy game and sure. uh, they were great about giving us feedback oh the, the vulture's too boxy and it wouldn't really fly like that and you know, I think uh, it was a lot of back and forth, and turned out to, I think, to be one of probably the, the happier surprises about how easy it was to work with them on the project. How about on the flip side? Can you give us an example or two of anything that they rejected, any units or, or ideas that they went, eh, nah, that's not quite Halo? Um, uh, probably uh, uh, most of the, most of the, I think, were on the story and you know, kind of understanding, uh, going back 20 years earlier, you know, what, what the Covenant kind of sensibilities would be at that time, and like if, first draft of our story i think that the covenant were a little too nice you know and coming off of, of halo 3 well kind of what would you expect yeah you know, um, and so we ended up going back and it was you know, like i said a lot of fun to kind of go to the bad guys and we made them more evil and and more visceral and uh, i was really happy with you know how that um, plays out in the tactics and you know the actual mechanics of the game i think we did a pretty decent job capturing the the evil feel of the covenant and their their play style versus the unsc and um, I think that, you know, Bungie was pretty happy with how that turned out as well. Um, you know, a lot of their comments, um, you know, they were were really critical about sort of making sure that we loved Halo as much as they did. And yeah, I think you know the first couple times we chatted with them, they they kind of grilled us here and there to you know to, to quiz our knowledge a little bit. Job interview? Uh, well, that's not a job interview, but you know, I mean, if, if you if you create something from scratch and then somebody else comes in and uh, you know wants to go take it in a completely different direction, even though. You know, it's become more well known recently that Halo started as a strategy game. That's not, you know, obviously how it's perceived by most folks. Um, yeah, you know, they, they certainly had opinions about all that stuff, and uh, yeah, you know, they they were 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 tough, but uh, in the end, you know, the bar that we had to hit was 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 a really good one, and the game's better for us really making sure that we dotted every Halo I and crossed every Halo T that that there was to do. Probably the mo one of the most helpful things that they did give us was. Uh, a shot from I think it was Halo One uh, technology uh, of their of Halo gameplay from a strategy camera, huh. and that really helped us uh, iterate a lot on the motion of our units. You know, um, when a, when a warthog's moving around, even though you're not there, kind of bouncing along with it as much as you are as you with you within uh, you know the first person shooter context, you have. You know, uh, I was playing last night and I got rushed by, by six warthogs. And those six warthogs come rolling into your base and they're sliding around and, and fish tail. And it, it looks like Halo. You know, and again, it, it, a lot of our, our mantra throughout the project was Halo, but different. Uh, you know, in Halo, you don't see a, a squadron of six warthogs come rolling in right. you know, kind of all that often. And it's cool to see that in Halo Wars. But then you look at each individual warthog and they still feel just like the Halo warthogs that you'd expect. Now that Bungie are aware of the project, Things like story and designs for the game had to be approved by them. 
They did have some free reign for some things, but when Ensemble asked, then Bungie would tell them. Ensemble sending them what they had to get feedback and change the game on said feedback would definitely slow down the project, especially since Bungie was working on Halo 3 at the time. They did, however, give Ensemble Studios a whole bunch of references, which was for the Halo film adaptation. Those references, plus the games, were the inspiration for the designs that would later be in Halo Wars. It also meant that the team had to recreate their assets from scratch. Around late 2005 to 2007, they had a team of about 25 engineers, artists and designers, and they were crunching non-stop. With E3 2007 around the corner, they made a rough demo. This demo was shown before the artist had a chance to tune the game's lighting. As for the other games, Wrench got cancelled, and that team moved on to other projects. Nova, the Diablo in Space game, which I believe was led by Dave Pottinger, got cancelled as well. The artist moved on to the MMO, and Dave and the rest of his team would move over to Project Phoenix. Dave Pottinger would eventually replace Graham Devine as lead. Morsa brought in to make the game ship, but with a change in leadership came a lot of changes. While these changes didn't necessarily come from the change in leadership, they had to change things like units and resource and unit management, which was proving difficult to manage on a controller, and going from sprawling base building to prefabricated bases. There were a lot of discussion about that last one. Sprawling base building would make players care about how they build their bases, which to be honest, it's what I'm used to and what I prefer, and what I spend a lot of time on sometimes. <laughs> Even rotating the buildings were discussed. But then the maps would end up being too flat due to the space of the buildings. They would tweak the sizes of the buildings, but that didn't work either. The map terrain were way too varied for it to work as the ground wasn't flat. They gave more space to locations, ideal for bases. But then the maps would be too boring so they would eventually end up with prefabricated bases. Those working on the MMO have been told that it would also be in the Halo universe. It should be noted that this MMO was greenlit, but after some shuffling around at Microsoft, it was later cancelled. Here are some of the screenshots that is known about the MMO. On September 10th, 2008, Microsoft announced to Ensemble Studios that it would close after Halo Wars' completion. They brought everyone in the studio into the project, going from around 25 people to over 100 people working on the last game Ensemble would create. The team would crunch for 1 to 2 months, then everybody would drift for 1 to 2 months, then repeat. In the final months of the project, they would essentially be working on bug fixing and putting in what they had worked on for years and making them work. But in the interest of time, they had to cut several features. One of the features was a fatality system to where Spartans and Covenant leaders would do massive damage to infantry units. It's kind of in the game, but probably not what they had planned. And the fatality system, we had to, we had to pull back a lot on that content because it just it was taking too long and it was actually when the arbiter decided to do this really awesome you know like spinning kind of whirlwind uh fatality on a whole group of marines with his energy swords um it was actually worse than if he just attacked them one by one and when, then when we, we cranked it up you know, to, to make it better well then it was a screw because people, then the hardcore guys instantly figured out how to get more fatalities than, than the average person could and yeah, we had some uh, more interesting uh, why abilities like the hunter, um, you know, uh, kind of tying into the uh, fiction of the hunters, you know, uh, the, the, the worm colony that gets big enough and it kind of splits into two and that's where the whole Bond brother thing mm -hmm. comes from. Um, and we had this really awesome, I, I really wanted the hunter to be able to charge. Uh, and, there's, and if, you, if you dig deep into the Halo lore, right, when one of the Bond hogs and that kind of thing. Yeah, when, when one of the Bond brothers dies, uh, the other, the other, the remaining one kind of goes insane, and we were going to send him into this fit of uncontrollable, charging, just massive death rage, and we were, we had it working, and then um, when we playtested it, and we should have figured this out on paper, 
been a problem because people couldn't figure out whether um, one hunter left was one hunter that was going to go to two because he hadn't gone to two yet or was two that had been knocked down to one. And, again, that, that kind of came up too late for us to, to add more art to differentiate the, the ragey state of the insane hunter. And so we had to cut that, that ability. And it ended up we re- rejuggled the entire tech tree for the hunter to – because we lost a lot of the Bond brother thing that we really wanted to play up, and it's a very cool part of the Halo lore that not a whole lot of people understand. Um, we wanted to, to really play that up, and so we had to, to rejuggle all the text, and we took his shield off of him um, to, to have a, a cool visual upgrade and things like that. But a Covenant campaign didn't happen because of a lack of manpower and money. We realized a long time ago that we just we didn't have the the manpower and, to be honest, you know, the, the money. Uh, the Burst cinematics are awesome, but they're not cheap. Thinking about doing a Covenant campaign, we I mean, we had a pretty good idea of the amount of gameplay we wanted in there. And yeah, I think on average, kind of looking at the, at the stats, you know, every game that people uh, play at the campaign, every scenario gets uploaded for stats and things like that too. And so you know, we're looking at the numbers. And I think you know, the average like one-time playthrough for somebody is like you know, in, the, in the nine to twelve-hour range, which is really about almost exactly where we wanted it. We didn't have time to just double that and add a Covenant campaign. <laughs> and so. We could do half as good a job on the UNSC one and put the Covenant one in there. We decided to just double down on the UNSC and do the best job we could at that and tell the story about the good guys and you know, kind of at, at that point we were leaving the bad guys for the sequel. Um, but uh, you know, some of the things that have happened to maybe kind of change those, those plans. Uh, I wish we had had time to, to do a Covenant campaign. Um, it would have been really fun to tell the bad guy story. Uh, it, it's just it's a, a choice we made really early on to focus the project and and really make sure that uh, you know, at that point we, we were worried about was this game going to even get done um, you know from a it was going to be fun and splitting our, our effort and telling the story and if uh, we hadn't figured out the gameplay for the covenant at all at that point um, it, it, we just we thought it was best to, to focus on one thing it should be noted that the flood being a playable race was also thought out but it never left the concept stage. According to Divine, the Flood would have needed to be similar to StarCraft's Zerg in order to maintain balance with the UNSC and Covenant. This did not match the Flood's role as the single scariest thing in the galaxy. On the 8th of January 2009, Halo Wars passed certification and was declared gold. Going gold in video games means that the game is essentially a completed game that is ready for publication. Not necessarily finished, as day one patches generally happen, but enough to start printing copies. On 26th of February 2009, the game was released, but with the release of Halo Wars, Ensemble would be no more, which they shut down a month prior, on the 29th of January 2009. The thing I talked about most uh, this time was just how how proud I was of the team for sticking together. Um, we had, I believe, 106 people when the closure announcement was made. Um, we lost exactly three people in the first week, and that was it. Nobody else left. Um, that is uneffing believable. Yeah. To be honest, I mean, we had, we were staring four months of death march crunch in the face. Um, we had been crunching for almost three months already, uh, and then you know it was during we took a two-week break from crunch, and in the middle of that was when we announced the, the closure got announced, and. To have three people leave, um, we, we were worried that, that 50 people would leave. Um, and I wouldn't have blamed any of them, you know, because yeah. they've got to do what they got to do for, for their future. And you know, Microsoft, um, they made their business decision, but I have to say they were excellent throughout the entire process. Um, as, given circumstances, I, I could not have um, come out of that with, with more respect for, for, for how they handled that. You know, the severance packages were just incredible, generous, and... I think uh, you know we're getting hopefully uh, you know, Robsy Robot Entertainment has started, um, and then hopefully the you know, Bonfire Studios can get off the ground and, and do great things. Uh, virtually everybody else at Ensemble has gotten a job as well. It's never easy to see something that uh, you built over you know 14, 15 years go away. Uh, yeah. I was I was employee number 11 uh, at Ensemble, and it's the only like real job I've ever had. Uh, Ensemble closed on a really high note, and um, I think everybody walked out of there very proud of what we were able to accomplish. As for the staff, 
think they are populated entirely by ex ensemble people. Uh, I, know, I know Robot is for sure. Obviously, that's the one that I'm most familiar with. Where we have 45 people that uh, started work today. Um, Bonfire, uh, you know, still working out all their business deals and stuff like that. And um, you know, they've got, uh, I think, yeah, 35 sounds about right from what I've, I've heard. Um, and yeah, you, you add that up, and that's 80. And you know, I know people. Uh, one of our guys went to. Ubi in Montreal, uh, a couple went to ID, one went to Blizzard, um, a couple went to Blizzard. Uh, you know, it, it, it's nice, I think, to see uh, see how how well and how easy, particularly in this economic climate, people were able to get jobs. Um, the ensemble name carried just a ton of street cred. Tony Goodman and some of the staff started an independent studio called Robot Entertainment, who would be supporting Halo Wars with DLC and Age of Empires Online. They're also the studio who created Orcs Must Die and Hero Academy. Dave Rippey, who was the producer, started Bonfire Studios, who made Wii Farm for iOS, which was renamed to Zynga Dallas after they were bought by Zynga. Several developers from Ensemble started New Toy Inc., who made Chess with Friends and Word with Friends, which was also bought out by Zynga and renamed to Zynga with friends, creating more with friends games. Dusty Monk started a one-man company called Windstorm Studios, but closed the studio on the 21st of March 2012 and joined Robot Entertainment. And finally, Boss Fight Entertainment, which was founded by the previous ensemble members and Zynga Dallas, which was Bonfile Studios, and they created Dungeon Boss, which was a mobile game. Okay, that took quite a bit, but I'm probably just scratching the surface with how old these articles were. A lot of the sites that had written articles about the studio and the rough development of Halo Wars has since closed and shut down. Even the Wayback Machine didn't have some of the archive of them. But moving on to the next segments. <laughs> like the rest of your race, weak and undisciplined. As stated in the development section, the art style is inspired by the reference material from Bungie, which were the same references for the Halo film, that as well as the inspiration from the Halo games themselves. In combination with the two, the art style heavily resembles those from Halo 2, Halo 3 and ODST, with a bigger emphasis on Halo 3 and ODST, and minor influence from Halo Combat Evolved. It makes the game more familiar when you recognize the units you're controlling, and the way they move. It's also more of a continuity thing. Spartan 2's armor is similar to Master Chief's armor in Halo Combat Evolved, seeing as how Halo 2 onwards having better tech. Spirits return to this game as transports for the Covenant troops, the owning campaign. They were the primary transport ships in Halo Reach and Combat Evolved, to which Bungie swapped them with Phantoms post Halo Combat Evolved in terms of timeline. Reach did have some phantoms, but they did have spirits as well. While engineers were first officially introduced in Halo 3 ODST, they were cut from Halo Combat Evolved, and the design of Halo Wars closely resembles that of Halo Combat Evolved engineers, rather than Halo 3 ODST. While yes, Halo Reach had engineers, though Reach came out after Halo Wars. Elites are more in line with Halo 1 and 2, sporting the shark fin design along with their elite honor guard brethren, though they're slightly different. As for the new units, a lot of them look like they could be from the Halo universe, like Hawks look similar to Falcons, and how Locusts look like mini Scarabs. Speaking of Scarabs, the E3 demo had the look of the Halo 2 Scarab, but the actual game looks like the Halo 3 Scarab, and parts of the E3 demo Scarab Looks like it's been moved to the Super Scarab. Even down to the weapons are recognizable. You got the beam rifles, the assault rifles, the plasma pistols, plasma rifles, needlers, brute shots, all that sort of stuff. The Prophet of Regret makes a return from Halo 2, but his chair gets some upgrades. Speaking about upgrades, most upgrades have a visual change for most of the units as well as the turrets. While we're talking about visual, everything is animated. Units have quite a bit of animations. They have moving animations both with full health and while damaged for vehicles. Attacking animations both regular fire and using abilities with melee units having executions on most infantry units as well as idling or if they're taken out. 
Spartans using Jack ability have different animations for different vehicles, as well as the driver getting thrown out. Abilities in the game weren't going to be a thing, but were added so that it would feel more like Halo, to where the infantry could use grenades, and certain vehicles could ram, and so on. Units aren't the only ones with animations, however. Every building has animations. When they're being built, when they're producing, when they're idling. Heck, even leader powers have animations. We gotta appreciate the little things, as they make the game feel more immersive. Way more immersive than watching two JPEGs fight. For the UI, the UNSC and the Covenant's UI are different from each other. The UNSC has a bluish color theme, whereas Covenant have a purple color theme. Which is fair, because the Covenant have always used purple. The UNSC are usually green, so not sure what happened there. The UNSC have a more unified UI compared to the Covenant's segmented UI, more so to emphasize that humanity stands united, whereas the Covenant are a group of races with no unified goal, like how the Grunts were essentially enslaved, and Jackals are basically mercenaries. In terms of the icons, the UNSC have a box type shape, whereas the Covenant have a more banner type shape. The health bars are also different. UNSC has an isosceles trapezium type shape to their health bars, while the Covenant have a more rounded shape, especially when they have shields. This I feel goes in line with their structures and architecture. The UNSC's base health bar is unique to where it shows how many buildings are built on the building spots, which isn't present on the Covenant base health bars. Halo Wars opted for the radio wheel menus to order units, buildings, and upgrades. Similar to Red Alert 3 on console, Though I feel like they do it better, as you're able to do it wherever, compared to Halo Wars to where you have to select a building to see its menus. Not only does visual matter, but sound does too. Most of the sounds that the weapons make sound like they come from the FPS games. The plasma pistol. The plasma rifle and the needler. which are all used in the main FPS games by the Covenant, Make a Return, Brutes have their iconic Brute Shots, and those infamous Jackals with their long-range weaponry, more notably from Halo 2 onwards. Though what I will say about Jackals is that they start off with Carbines, and those Carbines do sound like Carbines, But when you upgrade them so that they have defense gauntlet, which are their personal wrist-mounted shields, they start sounding like beam rifles, even though they have carbines. The next upgrade from that, though, are, in fact, beam rifles. <laughs> and they sound like beam rifles, so that's pretty good. But it's a little weird when their projectiles look like carbines, but sound like beam rifles. The beam rifles actually have a change in their projectiles though, so there is that. The fact that they all sound like the games, and that they all sound different from each other, you'll know which enemy is attacking you, even without seeing them. The only exceptions to this is that Hunters, Scarabs, and Vampire's Draining ability all sound the same, and that can get a little confusing on which ones are attacking you. A neat little thing they have, or an annoying one, is that you're able to hear battles that you don't have vision to. If they're attacking the base and you're currently hovering over the base, the sound will be slightly muffled, but you'll know that there is a battle there. You have to be pretty close to where the battle is in order to hear that they're having a battle. If they destroy a building or a base, everyone would know about it. There's a somewhat distant explosion that's muffled to indicate that someone has destroyed some form of building, whether it be from their own base or one of the insurrectionists or flood bases. Destroying bases have bigger, more explosion-type sounds, whereas buildings is just one giant explosion. Oh, 
base has been destroyed. A base has been destroyed. in one minute unless a base is claimed. There are also subtle environmental sounds, to the screeching sound of the flood and flood infested maps, to howling winds of the icy terrain, with a little more added detail to ice creaking. While we're talking about audio, some buildings have audio to them, but also all the units. We've already mentioned that the weaponry they wield have sound effects. But they all have multiple dialogue. All units have different dialogue for each action. They have idle dialogue, which is mostly exclusive to infantry, death dialogue, killing dialogue, teammates dying, being attacked by different units, like marines would actually say what they're being attacked by, which is a neat thing, attacking the enemy, moving dialogue, and which units are being selected. While there's not a lot of variation for each, there is variation, so it's nice not hearing the same ones over and over. Each unit also has different voices, for the most part, which just adds to the variety. And while you're more than likely going to see which units you have, it's nice to have audio to back up the visual aspects of the game. The environment is also varied. You will be playing on different parts of the ring, where the different environments are either icy, flood-infested areas, or grassy terrain. Plus the human settled worlds, where you'll be in the city or the outskirts of the city where there aren't that many buildings or even ruins. There's even a remake of an FPS map for you to play on which has been remade multiple times over each game. And that map is Blood Gulch, though tuned for RTS. As stated in the development portion, the maps are varied in terms of height. If you want to learn more about maps. You should look at the video, Halo Wars, The Terrain of Next Gen by Colt McKenless at his GDC talk. The game does have extras, which has concept art, which is pretty neat. Some of the things there look like they come from the Halo Legends shorts. Brute Chieftain, also known as Thrallslayer, also looks like a chieftain that was in Halo Legends, though the short story, The Babysitter, came out several months after Halo Wars came out. The music is pretty outstanding. It's familiar, yet different. It gives its own flavor when using the motif of the original soundtrack of Halo Combat Evolved. For the campaign, the music is beautifully paced, especially in the cutscenes, where they're timed spectacularly. Though there are some spots where I feel like they could have dragged out a few scenes to add more tension. The songs played are dependent on the environment. There's a couple of intro songs that swap between each other on different missions for campaign and different playthroughs in Skirmish. The song for the environment plays. The song for the environments aren't overpowering, which is good. We don't need the music to be loud and energetic throughout the game. You need the music to be dynamic, both in terms of dynamic range and those that trigger when an action happens. You can't enjoy the good as much as if you haven't experienced the bad. You wouldn't enjoy music as much without experiencing the quiet parts, and sometimes less is more, and in some cases, nothing is the most. Like I said in the Blinks retrospective, music that's constantly playing, especially if it loops, you're more than likely going to drown it out and not listen to it, or it gets too annoying. The fact that it's more dynamic here definitely helps it out a lot. Even playing in the lower difficulties, you're probably not going to have music playing, which is good. This game also has some form of dynamics in terms of reactive music. When you target an enemy building with three or more units, you will play a more heavier tone of music to suggest that there is conflict. It can feel pretty off if you just melt the base completely, as it'll reach the crescendo without even building it up. As a whole, the story isn't bad. The deeper you look into it, the more you question about it. Like what kind of military force stands in the open, walking slowly so they can get shot? A full forward assault would leave us too exposed. We have to look at other options. It's gonna be a meat grinder, dude. Energy swords were only given to high or important ranks when in service to the Covenant. Yet elite miners are seen carrying them. Why does the Covenant find something and the eyes complicate things? Them finding something could make them a little distracted, so it would 
generally be easier to take them out when they're distracted. Sure, they could fortify their position, but that takes time. Unless they view humans as infections. Why isn't the infection, assuming it's the flood, taken more seriously? And that's just the first two cutscenes. I will say though, that the voice acting is superb. Robert Atkin Downs reprises his role as the Prophet of Regret, and does an amazing job. Nolan North is in a lot of games, and he does a great job as Forge. Courtney Taylor and Kim, my guest, did great as Serena and Anders respectively. Courtney is Jack from Mass Effect 2 and 3, and Kim is Hannah, the one on the crane controls in Pharos, as well as Captain Matsuo in Novaria from the first Mass Effect game. When it comes to Halo, the graphics for the cinematic cutscenes were phenomenal for its time which was made by Blur Studio. While it's not up to the quality of Halo Wars 2 and Halo 2 Anniversary, which Blur also made, there are some things I question that I've pretty much already listed, but there are some pretty neat parts too. The Banshees coming into land when opening the Relic and Harvest, or sending in bases at the beginning as the Spirit of Fire comes in with the music. Kinda sad that Douglas, Jerome, and Alice are just named Spartan in any of the cutscenes, but are named appropriately during the game. They do name drop Pillar of Autumn, so it has some ties to the FPS games, so that's neat. For the most part, the in-game cutscenes and dialogue is just telling you how to play, or what to expect in the moment, and that you should train certain units. It does do the Super Scarab and the Flood reveal through in-game cutscenes, though I guess the reason why they do certain cutscenes in game instead of cinematic is because they don't really add too much to the overall story. The flood reveal, while they did have an infected elite, probably would have been more impactful through cinematic cutscenes. Halo Wars also has the Halo timeline, which only has entries between Arcadia Colony opening the Deep Space Research Array, or the DSRA for short, all the way to the Great Schism in Halo 2. The later entries, which are essentially the FPS games reached to Halo 2, are very vague and don't have a lot of entries for any of them, but they are mentioned. The bulk of the timeline focuses mostly on the events before Halo Wars and during Halo Wars, while adding some entries before those and after. They have some info about the ship, Spirit of Fire, and a little about their crew. Cut up and how he became the captain of Spirit of Fire, Forge having been incarcerated, and it would have been the end of his career if Admiral Cole hadn't stepped in, as well as Professor Anders not wanting to use Dr. Anders as her name. They also have some extra context to the story of Halo Wars, like Sergeant Forge having a fight with Douglas because Douglas wanted to destroy the ship that Anders was captured in. It doesn't just focus on the humans in UNSC, it has some entries from the Covenant as well. It tells you how Regret ascended to become a prophet, a little backstory for Ripper Morami, which is the current arbiter in the Halo Wars game, and the living conditions of the different species of the Covenant. I find it a little weird though, that the scrolling function happens really quickly, and that you have to constantly scroll up in order to read it, as it'll constantly scroll down after 4 seconds, as well as having to click on the entries instead of immediately showing up, is also a weird choice. I should point out that my experience with the game have all been the definitive edition on PC. While I have played the 360 version back in the day, I don't have it or the console to test them out. Another thing too is that I'm not an RTS god. I can probably squeak my way around medium to hard AI on StarCraft or Red Alert 3, but I'm brutal on both games. It would require multiple restarts to get a feel for how the AI behaves and most of the games have either been on skirmish or campaign, so take what I say with a grain of salt. Other than that, Halo Wars is generally slow paced compared to StarCraft 2, which I get that StarCraft can have variable speeds, but it definitely feels faster. Red Alert 3, while slower than StarCraft, had a slightly faster speed for its console version, but the thing with Red Alert 3 on console, it felt more snappy in terms of moving the units which overall made it feel faster. 
and having faster economy. In Halo Wars, the units are slow to respond, and consecutive commands issued to units would slow their movement down to a crawl. While you're not generally giving consecutive commands on a macro scale, micromanaging units when sending the weaker units away from combat would most likely be an issue. On top of that, the economics of the game is definitely the slowest one of the games mentioned, both in campaign and skirmish. Since we talked about prefabricated buildings in the development portion of this retrospective look, I'll expand on it here. Each base site has a maximum of 7 building slots you can build on. In order to get more building slots, you would have to go to another building spot and upgrade those bases. When one supply pad or warehouse gives you 3.9 resources per second, low starting resource count, and a limited amount of building spots, you'll be starved for resources. The worst part about it is degradation. The more supply pads you have, the less efficient they become. One supply pad gives you 3.9 per second, while having 6 will net you 15.6, or 2.6 per supply pad. With that said, most of your building slots will most likely be occupied by supply pads or warehouses. Not only that, but everything is upgraded with resources as well. StarCraft had Vespian gas for more stronger, more specialized units as well as upgrades. In terms of Red Alert 3, there aren't unit upgrades per se, but you do need certain buildings for Soviets to build certain units, as well as certain buildings and clearances in order to build certain units for Allied and the Empire of the Rising Sun. But the thing with Red Alert 3 is that you're most likely able to build all the buildings and get the clearances with just the starting resources for Skirmish as well as faster resource gain, at least initially because oil refineries aren't infinite. When everything is trained, built, and upgraded with resources, it can feel very slow when you have very low resources to begin with. On top of that, you have low population count. Red Alert 3 had infinite amount on PC, and StarCraft had 200, though you needed to build additional pylons. You must construct additional pylons or the other faction equivalent to that. But why would you compare PC games to console games, you might be wondering. I cannot understand that point for StarCraft, but for Red Alert 3, Halo Wars was ported over to PC 8 years after releasing on consoles with minimal adjustments, and Red Alert 3 was ported to Xbox 360 a month after it came out on PC, which had its population count reduced to 50. On top of that, both Red Alert 3 versions were released before Halo Wars came out. With 50 being max population for Red Alert 3, it's on par with The Covenant maxed out, barring certain game modes and population increasing garrisoned buildings. The catch though, is that each unit had one population cost. Apocalypse tanks, Athena cannons, wave force artillery, you name it. It all costs one population. But also your nanocores, which are used to build your imperial military structures, does cost one population until it starts building, in which case it gets reduced. But for all refineries, that one population moves to the ore collector. It should be noted, however, that infantry in Halo Wars, barring hero units, spawn squads which costs and acts like one unit, more akin to Command and Conquer Tiberium Wars, compared to the one unit per population like StarCraft and red alert. In a way, having it as it is would make it feel like the fights are bigger than they actually are, but really, they feel very small in comparison due to the very low population. Thus having low building slots, low resources, and low population make it a bad game compared to Command & Conquer Red Alert 3 or StarCraft 2? Well, no. It's just a different type of strategy. With so many things limited, one could argue that limitation breeds creativity. Well, yeah, but a better saying would be, fortune favors the bolt. It isn't uncommon to have the first base containing mostly supply pads or warehouses and quickly getting an expansion while building initial forces. A chosen leader is enough to scare off units built in the time it takes to get your second base up and running. Same deal with UNC though, you'll be building warthogs and using their ram as damage. Doing so would make you better off in the early to mid game, 
This generally means that you're more than likely going to be specking into and building one type of unit, which does work well against human players. But against legendary AI and automatic over 100, it's very random. One way to counteract the randomness is to play on a big map and build your forces up. While we're talking about buildings, prefabricated buildings has its downsides. You also have limited turret spaces, and depending on where the enemy attacks, some of these turrets, if not most of them, become utterly useless as they're not going to have enough range to attack aggressors on the other side of the building. Both factions have a way of building buildings that build their own infantry, vehicles, and air units, as well as gathering supplies. You honestly have two unique buildings, which are your reactors and field armory. Reactors increase tech levels, which increase in price by 250 the more you build. There isn't a cap on how many generators you can build, and the price of them doesn't degrade at all. Though there isn't a point to getting more than 4 tech levels, and field armory for your general upgrades. Covenant have shield generators, which put a shield over your base that has to be destroyed before damaging any non-turret buildings. The more shield generators you have, the stronger the shield. They also get a temple, which basically combines what the reactors and field armory do into one building, on top of creating your leader, though the first one spawns with the temple. While you can build multiple reactors for more tech levels and field armory for double the research speed, you can only have one leader temple at a time. With that said, the Covenant have an easy time with buildings in terms of building slot efficiency and defensive capabilities, though you're spending more resources to upgrade your tech levels. Covenant fully maxed out tech level requires at least 3,500 resources. It should be noted that when the leader temple is destroyed, you lose all your tech levels. But if you build it back up again, you get all your tech levels back. Contrast that with the UNSC. Each time you buy a reactor, the cost goes up by 250, or upgrade those you have by 1200 resources each. Seeing as how you can only upgrade the reactors once, and the fact that you need at least 4 to get the highest upgrades possible, and if they get destroyed, you have to buy them and the upgrades again. Buying each reactor individually will cost less to build overall, ending up costing 2,500 at the expense of 4 building slots, while upgrading 2 reactors nets you 3,150. And for the heck of it, 3 slots with 1 upgraded cost 2,700. As for the field armory, once you fully upgrade everything it has to offer, you're more than likely going to scrap it, as there wouldn't be a need for it anymore. Both bases have the ability to lock down, which is a pretty good feature. If your enemies are knocking at your doorstep, building units without locking the base will result in them being singled out and will get killed before they can do anything. Locking the base down would stop that from happening. When unlocked, the units stored within those bases will come out one by one, but in quick succession, so you're more than likely going to have an army to attack their army. Unoccupied building sites have a weird interaction with units, in a sense where the units act like there is a building there therefore going around the vacant land. This can be a big problem for larger units, as they'll slow down or get stuck. I guess this was implemented so that it would be easier to target it to create a base, but the trade-off being pathing issues. I feel like that's not a good thing. By the way, I'm talking about building sites for fire bases, not building slots. They can intentionally push units away that are standing on a building slot, which stops some units attacking for the time it takes for them to move. More on pathing. What's the deal with impossible hitboxes for your units? Not only that, but why are their hitboxes so big? I get that StarCraft and Red Alert 3 implemented it too, so that units don't overlap each other, but in StarCraft, they just nudge units out of the way. And in Red Alert 3, units move out of the way. It can get really annoying when you have to funnel units down a narrow lane. The neat thing about their pathing is that if you have a group selected, they'll travel together only going as fast as the slowest unit in the group, though I feel like they go slightly slower than that, but it is there. This can be pretty good as your faster units won't go in one by one to get destroyed. Sometimes however, air units will travel on their own. Air units will travel as a group, but separately, to ground units. If you want faster units to go faster, you're gonna have to select them separately. The campaign missions have a sense of flow in a sense that where some missions feel like extensions of the previous mission. Alpha base, relic approach, and relic interior 
is an example of this, which is essentially your intro missions. Alpha Base teaches you how to move your units, camera controls, moving multiple units, and micromanaging certain units to perform certain tasks. Once Alpha Base is secure, you rebuild Alpha Base in Relic Approach to where you learn about base building and unit production and garrison units. And once you've amassed an army, you storm to the Relic site to stop them from detonating the entrance. You also get to fight a Covenant base and potentially take that building site for yourself. Relic Interior emphasizes more on unit abilities than other missions. Despite having a feel for it in the previous two missions, but also shows you that you can interact with certain objects. Like the first mission though, you don't have access to any buildings. It's also the last time this happens. While you may start out without bases or buildings to produce more units, in certain missions at least, eventually you'll be given a base, or you'll have one later. Arcadia is where it gets interesting. It's the first time the game introduces you to a lot of different Covenant units and buildings. While you have to defend civilians trying to get into three transports, Banshees, Vampires and Locusts are introduced. And while there's only like three or four wraiths in total in the first three missions, there's more of them here. And the super turret is first introduced here. But towards the end of the mission when it's not gonna matter anymore. But as for your units, it's the first time you get to control Hornets, which I'll get to in a bit. You start off defending civilians getting out of buildings that the Covenant are bombarding. Then you get a choice on base building, the eastern region which is located on a concrete area, and the western region which is on grassy area. You could choose both, which what I said earlier stands true here. Getting both will be hard to start out with, but ultimately end up being easier in the long run. As an aside, there's a fully maxed out Covenant base east of your eastern base, which can be trouble as your units exit your base in that direction, which makes building in that location more difficult. If you don't even take the Eastern base, the Covenant will take it for themselves, which would be harder to retake. Even on Legendary, the Hornets you start out with and Forge will be enough to protect the ships in the beginning, so taking both bases is definitely the play. You do get AI-controlled Spartans after all. You don't get to control them yourself in this mission, but they can definitely hold their ground when needed. Not only that, if hero units in campaign fall in battle, they can be revived, so not a lot of consequences when hero units die. But Arcadia City and to an extent Arcadia Outskirts, the difficulty spikes up so much compared to the first three missions. You constantly get new units in the first mission, you get a base that sometimes gets attacked but don't do enough damage to warrant a lot of attention. You can even stop attacks coming in so there's no stress. And Grizzlies are really strong units so that they just mop up all the units there. Not only that but all three don't have a time limit so you can go super slow and not lose anything. But the whole campaign, while there are 15 missions, I would say 2-3 to three missions linked together before they transition to a new area. In the mission shield world, you have to save three groups of units, and you can actually save them in any order, and they'll have different dialogues for each one, even if you do them out of order. A weird interaction with the camera in campaign is, it's always very zoomed in, even if you set it to be zoomed out in the menus. That only zooms out in skirmish and multiplayer games. Each mission has a skull and a black box. Halo games have had skulls implemented since Halo 2, to where you can change certain parameters depending on the skull you activate which makes its way here, which is neat when you want to change things up a little. And the black box is just a collectible which adds codexes to entries to the Halo timeline section. The way you obtain the black boxes is to find them on the map, while the way to obtain a skull is to complete certain side objectives in each mission. It's a neat way of obtaining the skulls, but it can be pretty difficult depending on which difficulty you choose. The achievements in this game aren't super difficult to obtain, though it requires different strategies which can be difficult, but you can usually do them in any difficulty, which I guess takes us to difficulty. The game has five different difficulties, four for campaign, but five for skirmish. Easy, normal, heroic, legendary, and the extra one being automatic. Like the shooter counterparts, you can meme on the enemies in heroic, but can be taken out if you aren't too careful. Legendary is definitely a couple of notches harder in comparison to heroic, but definitely doable in campaign. In skirmish matches, a little unfair but doable. But what about automatic? 
It's basically an AI scaler, which is only available in Skirmish. Getting to 100 is the equivalent of changing the difficulty to Legendary, which they get an economy multiplier of 133% of normal supplies, 33% boost in normal damage given, and 75% of normal damage taken. They also get an increase of 50% when it comes to building and training units in deathmatch. What's the highest automatic can go? 200. At that point, the AI gets 233% on normal supplies, 140% boost in building and training in deathmatch, 133% boost to normal damage given, and 40% normal damage taken. That makes your counter units lose to those that they counter. An example would be your Jackal Sniper, which excels at eliminating infantry with die to marines, which are infantry. Fun times. Another thing about that is, you're gonna need more than two scarabs to deal with their scarab. You don't believe me? While we're talking about units, the general rule of all units is in a rock paper scissors pattern. Air beats vehicles, vehicles beats infantry, and infantry beats air. I'm not sure if it's just me, but my time playing legendary and an automatic difficulty above 100, and the AI being covenant, I had a way easier time just mass producing air units. I get that infantry should destroy me, which if I spam hornets or hawks, the AI usually spams infantry or vehicles. If I spam vultures, that's when they'll send vampires, though that's wholly dependent on if they decide to build a summit. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It's all random. The only time I felt threatened is if they have a scarab. Vampires or brutes, maybe hero units. The other infantry units don't do as much damage to my air units. The way they balance the UNSC and the Covenant, Covenant have a higher population count, at the expense of weaker units. Suicide Grunt's DPS is mostly on their explosions, which don't reach air units. Grunts don't have an RPG ability like the Marines, so they don't do as much as they would. Jackal Snipers are good at attacking infantry only. Hunters don't even attack air units. What about vehicles? The damage ghosts and wraiths do, you're better off just sending them somewhere else. And locusts do okay sustain damage. But once their shields are gone, they're glass cannons. Other air units, rare occasions, will they send just banshees? Other than a rush start? Even more rare that they start sending vampires. With UNSC as the AI enemy, marines upgraded to RPG will have some form of defense to air units and can do decent amount without them. Do they use them on air units? Yeah, mostly just on regret when regret is fully upgraded and they definitely use it against vultures. Spartans can hijack them, although they can't hijack vultures. They have enough shields to deal with the other air units, and deal decent enough damage to really good damage when fully upgraded. Wait, hogs are great anti-air early game, with just gunner, and goss hogs do considerable damage. They can chase air units if they retreat, and they have enough speed to dodge banshee bombs or rockets. If you're good with your micro and your macro, Wolverines will generally destroy the air units, though on legendary AI and automatic AI above 100, they can do damage back. But with everything, if your micro and macro game is strong, you can take minimal damage when being attacked by most things. Hornets with their missiles, as well as Hawks, can even have more damage, so they'll win the fight. Vultures will decimate Banshees and can even go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a few vampires with stasis. Mac cannons can destroy your air units, as well as Cryobomb having the chance to outright stop your air units from flying, in this case living. Especially if they get veteran C stars. Three stars maximum, unless a Spartan takes control of a vehicle, in which case they can get up to 14 stars. Each star grants bonus damage and damage resistance. It incentivizes you to try and keep your veteran units alive, though they die almost as easily on higher automatic difficulties. So if you let your higher difficulty AI units rack up some veteran stars, you better keep those leader powers ready. 
While we're talking about leader powers, each leader plays slightly different. It goes without saying that you want to see leaders play differently to covenant leaders. If you played the campaign, you would know all the UNSC leader powers, which are Mac Blast, Carpet Bomb, and Cryo. They're spread between Captain Cutter, Sergeant Forge, and Professor Anders, respectively. There are a few powers that all UNSC leaders have, which is Disruption Bomb. That one isn't in the campaign, though, more so because you don't fight Covenant leaders on the ground. All UNSC leaders also have Transport and Heal and Repair. With Transport, you pick which units you want to move, and where you want to move them. It should be noted that 3 vehicles and 6 infantry of any kind is the maximum amount of units that can be transported. That number isn't interchangeable. You can have 3 vehicles and 6 units in the same pelican, but you can't remove your infantry to get more vehicles. Not only that, but you can only transport your units to what is visible to you, whether it be near a base or new units. A way to play around the low amount of units that can be transported is that there is no cooldown, but at the expense of 200 resources. The counterplay that was added is that the pelican can be destroyed. Heal and repair's effectiveness depends on how many units or structures need healing inside the circle. If your whole battalion needs healing, you're not going to heal them as much as if one unit or structure that needs healing in the healing field. Another feature is that if units are taking damage in the healing field, they're not going to get the healing effect for a few seconds. When these two are in tandem with each other, the ability can potentially be weak outside of combat and it can be pointless inside of combat. A benefit though, the cooldown starts as you launch the ability. By the time it finishes, the cooldown is almost halfway done. Heal and Repair can be disrupted by Disruption Bomb, however. And Disruption Bomb stops the use of all powers within a large radius, both UNSC and Covenant alike. Disruption Bomb can't be destroyed and it lasts for a minute. Feels more devastating when used against the Covenant, especially at their base. It isn't a bad thing to use it away from their bases though. A very cheesy move would be to use all your powers, then use Disruption Bomb so they can't retaliate. Using it on a Covenant leader also removes the ability to hot drop their units to the leader. Nor can the leader use the recall ability. If you have a lot of units, that Covenant leader's dead. Especially considering the fact that units block paths. It isn't uncommon for an AI to have a skeleton crew with their Covenant leader, then send in reinforcements once they're built. It's even more common against certain players. Disruption Bomb will ruin their day. But if they leave the radius, they're free to recall, use abilities, or send in troops. How big is the radius? A good measurement would be about what you can see when you're zoomed out to the max, plus a little more. Both the Covenant and UNSC have the ability to control where your global rally point will be. What that means is that once units are created, they will move to that designated point, no matter which base. You can set up local rally points for individual bases as well. All you want to see have hero units as well, which are three unnamed Spartans. Spartans that also have upgrades to them. Captain Carter gets access to Mac Blast, Elephants, and ODSTs, as his unique units and all bases have one higher tech level, which can be a pretty big advantage. Not as great economy-wise as Sergeant Forge or Professor Anders, but still an advantage. Not having to upgrade each base one more than the other UNSC leaders is pretty good. You're not spending 300 per upgrade, as well as waiting around for said upgrade to finish. Mac Blast does a considerable amount of damage within a somewhat small radius, which can be upgraded to 4 shots total. On Legendary, even slightly higher on Automatic, Four shots won't be enough to take down the Scarab. The Scarab will be pretty low, but you will have a decent chunk of health to deal with. But Mac Blast plus one Mega Barrage from a Vulture should take down any Scarab at that difficulty. Even like five Vultures with Mega Barrage is enough to bring a Scarab down to its knees if they decide to have two Scarabs. When controlling leader powers on PC, it can get pretty difficult when using it on a locust that's outside of your vision, but is visible because they're attacking you. Trying to use a mouse as a controller generally doesn't go well. Of course, you could always use WASD or arrows to move your screen around, 
but that's wholly dependent on the speed you set it on. It can even attack air units like vultures. Elephants double as mobile barracks to train your infantry units, which you can rush a base with. Once you upgraded marines to ODSTs, you can call in a maximum of 10 ODSTs from orbit per cooldown. It does have a cooldown when obtaining ODSTs as it loads one at a time. Both elephants and ODSTs in tandem make Cutter very good at suppressing with how efficient he can train infantry units and send them out to battle. Another thing players like to do is create a sort of super unit to where they would have an elephant plus a whole bunch of vehicles on the same spot and they take a long time to destroy. They're very good defensively, but lose its luster once they have to start moving. But I wasn't able to get it to work, whether it's only doable on console or I'm not too sure. A weird interaction with elephants that are locked down in buildings. The buildings themselves seem like they have some sort of damage resistance. Sergeant Forge has a carpet bomb, cyclops and grizzlies. Forge's passive is that he can build heavy supply pad right at the beginning without having to build a regular one. It does cost the same amount if you were to upgrade a base supply pad into a heavy one, which is more than twice the price of a base supply pad, but it's still an advantage early to mid game. Late game is not going to matter too much. Carpet Bomb doesn't do as much damage as the Mac Blast, but it does cover a wider area than the Mac Blast. It's more used to thin out the herd. Upgrading Carpet Bomb adds more damage and increases the distance traveled of the Short Sword Bomber. While it can hit air units, it is advised not to use it against them. The Carpet Bomb is pretty unique, where it's the only one where you can start off targeting something within your view, but can continue outside the fog of war. Cyclopses are anti-structure melee units who can repair ground units, structures, and other Cyclopses when you upgrade them once and an increase in movement speed when fully upgraded. The healing isn't the best, but it's nice to have when heal and repair is on cooldown. Cyclopses also have an ability to where they slam their fists to the ground. When used on a building, they'll grab a chunk of the building and toss it back at the building, which does extra damage. The ability is on a relatively short cooldown compared to the other units, so it has quite the DPS when bursting buildings. Same thing with vehicles, though they pick apart a small chunk which does less damage. It doesn't really do much against infantry however, as they don't throw anything at them, nor does it do any significant damage towards them. Grizzlies are stronger scorpions, having an increase in health and firing rate. There are debates on whether or not upgrading scorpions to power turrets, which are an upgrade under the grizzlies, are better than the grizzlies themselves. With a straight up fight with each other, Without canister shells, the grizzly should come out on top, but with canister shell, power turret scorpions would reign supreme. Why is that though? Grizzly's canister shell does more damage, but distributes its damage on a wider area compared to scorpions, which is a more tighter spread. The bonus damage and health does give the grizzlies an edge when it comes to multiple infantry, buildings, and its counters. When it comes to single target damage though, maybe the power turret scorpions is the way to go. The final UNSC leader is Professor Anders, who is rocking with Cryobomb, Gremlins and Hawks. Her passive ability is that unit upgrades are half price and research time is halved, which is good all around. While technically out of all the UNSC leaders, she's the one with the least optimal economy when accumulating resources due to Forge having heavy supply pads right away and Captain Cutter has higher base tech right off the bat, leading to more supply pads. Anders would have faster unit tech. Crybomb and Gremlins are more support than anything, but they're really good. Gremlins can disable enemy vehicles. Fairly certain they can stun a Scarab, but a very small amount to the point it's kinda pointless. But it still stuns for like half a second. If you come in with Gremlins plus Scorpions, you'll delete all of their vehicles very easily especially after Chain Amplifier, where you can disable multiple vehicles clustered together. Cryobomb can freeze an area for a set amount of time and take out a random amount of air units. Upgrading Cryobomb will increase the time it takes for them to thaw out and on top of that, take out more air units. And if you use Cryobomb on buildings, they'll stop producing units and upgrades and turrets will freeze, rendering them useless. If they have a Covenant leader, 
and you're a good shot at it. It can count as a second disruption bomb, making their leader frozen. The downside of this compared to disruption bomb is that they can still send in units through the teleporter to help them out. It's even strong enough to freeze uber units like vultures and scarabs, so you can get good hits in before it can attack, or straight up insta-kill vultures if you're a gambler. Hawks are amazing, especially when you have multiple of them. They will tear through anything the AI can dish out at you. They're definitely an upgrade compared to the chaff pod hornets. As for UNSC specific upgrades that they get from the field armory, the UNSC gets reserves, which trains units faster. Reinforcements, which increases the population by 10, which is from 30 to 40. Adrenaline, which increases the movement speed of infantry units. Turrets can upgrade your base turrets from small, medium to large. And specific and leader specific abilities like Mac Cannon, Carpet Bomb, and Cryo Bomb by three times. On the Covenant side, their leaders are the Arbiter. Not Thelvatami or Thelvatam, which takes away the double E suffix after the Great Schism from Halo 2. But a different Arbiter, known as Ripa Morami. There's also Brute Chieftain, who is also called Thrall Slayer, and the Prophet of Regret. The one and the same from Halo 2. For the most part, the Covenant leaders play very similarly. The only differential things that make them play differently are the actual leaders and their unique units. Everything else is the same, as there are no passives the Covenant possess, and the units are the same, barring unique units. Only passive is for the leader unit passive. One advantage of the Covenant leader powers is the fact that they don't have cooldowns, and are only limited by the resources you have. All hero units, including Spartans, when killed, have to be produced in their respective buildings. All Covenant leaders have the ability to recall their leader, which you have to click on the gravity lift, which lets you both recall and set your global rally point. Recall can be really useful if your covenant leader is in danger. You can recall them to a specific gravity lift. The things that stop that from happening would be the disruption bomb, though you can leave the area then recall, cry a bomb because they'll be frozen or if your leader dies. Another thing the gravity lift can do is to transport your troops to your leader though it's a one-way teleporter for your units, and can be disrupted when a disruption bomb is used or if your leader dies. Arbiter has two energy swords, and is a melee unit. He has the ability called Rage, to where his initial jump strike can deal massive AoE damage, and he can combo for single target damage. Rage is the only way the Arbiter himself can attack air units. His combo attack in Rage mode will have him jump on top of air units and start smashing his swords into it. Though, be careful as, if the enemy is onto you, they can move that unit to an unwalkable place and instantly kill your Arbiter. Rage can be upgraded to where he gains health on kills, use less resources to maintain his rage, and increase his combo damage, and gives damage boost to all nearby allies. His passive reflects damage back to enemies, increasing his own damage, and giving him permanent cloak ability. The way cloak works is that they can't be attacked until they attack themselves, which can be a little glitchy, especially against AI Arbiters as you sometimes can't target him, even though he's a third way through your army. Adversely, he can sometimes be attacked before he initiates an attack, so it's a little finicky sometimes. There's also a weird glitch to where you can run faster with the rage ability, but I wasn't able to get it to work. Whether it's only doable on console or I'm not too sure. Arbiter's unique units are suicide grunts. Their plasma pistols are nothing to write home about, but when they start bombing themselves, they can annihilate bases. Pair that with the teleport to leader, and the chaos will ensue. I think I had like 10-ish fully maxed out suicide grunts, and they totaled an automatic AI of about 130, which is harder than legendary. Thrall Slayer, or Brute Chieftain, gets the Vortex ability, and wields a gravity hammer. The gravity hammer is very slow compared to Arbiter's dual energy sword, but you can upgrade Thrall Slayer to give him a stun ability. This is very good against Spartans. He even has more health than Spartans so he can destroy them before they can destroy him, though you will find that with every Covenant Leo. Thrall Slayer just does it better. What's even better is that he can pull enemies towards him and stun them until they are killed or Thrall Slayer is killed. Upgrading him even more gives him an AoE stun 
and can sometimes pull multiple units to him if they're really close together. His vortex ability, like Arbiter's Rage, is the only time Thrall Slayer can attack air units. While Arbiter's Rage is more single fire damage, Thrall Slayer's Vortex is more of an AoE damage. While Arbiter's Rage has a strong initial attack, Thrall Slayer has a big explosion at the end of his Vortex, which Vortex can be cancelled manually, so he can finish off units and move on more quickly. Upgrading Vortex only increases its damage and area effect. Thrall Slayer's main light vehicle unit is the Chopper, which is replaced by the Ghost when using Arbiter or Prophet of Regret. Unlike the Ghost, however, Choppers don't have their auto cannons in the beginning, like how Hogs need to research Gunner in order for them to have an attack other than the ramming into enemies. When comparing Choppers and Ghosts, we've already talked about auto cannons, but Ghosts are more agile, being able to strafe and attack at the same time. Choppers have to look at their enemies in order to fire. Choppers have stronger ramming abilities where Ghosts are able to gain shields. Choppers generally do more damage and have more hit points as well. Another unique unit that the Thrall Slayer has are Jump Pack Brutes with Brute Shots. They deal more damage than your basic infantry and can reposition with their jetpacks when upgraded. And when fully upgraded, can periodically stun vehicles with their electric shots. Very devastating for an infantry unit. A small change is that their Grunt Squad contains a Brute instead of an Elite that the other two Covenant leaders send forth. These Grunt Squads deal slightly more damage than their Elite-led counterpart. Thrall Slayer can also do a sort of glitch run type thing, but I haven't been able to do it. You can check out more by searching Halo Wars, glitches and multiplayer tips by Turnip Vids. The final leader that the Covenant Force has in store is the Prophet of Regret. Regret sits on his throne, which is equipped with plasma cannons which can be upgraded to Fuel Rod Cannons, making Regret the only ranged hero as far as the Covenant is concerned. He is also the only one with shields. Upgrading Regret even further will allow him to be escorted by two Protector Sentinels, which add to his damage, as well as give him the ability of True Flight. While able to fly, the Prophet of Regret can still get resources, making him the only flying unit that can. This upgrade can also be problematic when facing other Covenant leaders, as vampires can put anything into stasis, including regrets. Well, almost everything, as vultures will be slowed, but can still move and shoot, albeit at a slow rate. Regrets active ability calls upon the cleansing beam, beaming down a glassing beam from an orbiting vessel. Upgrading cleansing increases its damage and radius. Cleansing, along with other Covenant Leader abilities, are very strong. The cleansing starts off slow, but ramps up in size and damage, which can bring down any unit, even vultures. Regret's unique unit is an elite honor guard, melee unit which specializes in, well, close quarters. A little hard fight if the enemy has a bunch of snipers. Against legendary AI, if you can outnumber the jackals, they will come out on top, though if they're fully upgraded, you're gonna need more. When honor guards are fully upgraded, they have the active camo ability, and having personal shields, which would help immensely. Using active camo while the enemy still has vision over you will not go over well as they can still fire at you, so that's something to work around. As stated before, it can be a little weird when facing the AI to where they can and will respond sometimes. Other times, they will not. As for Covenant upgrades, we've covered each leader-specific active and leader-specific passive each leader possess. But they get more than that. Like the UNSC, the Covenant can upgrade their turrets from small to medium to large, as well as increase their population count by 10, which is higher than the UNSC with their 40 to 50 cap. They also have the ability to research a new age, like how you would with any age games, to where you can produce different units or upgrades. A unique upgrade to the Covenant is Forerunner Shields, to where all their shields regenerate faster. As stated before, the Temple is like a reactor, when destroyed, they lose their tech levels and gain it all back when it's rebuilt. The first age or tech level is gained from building the temple itself. While the Flood aren't playable without modding the game, I thought I should at least touch up on them. They work mostly like the FPS games, to where the carrier forms hold infection forms in them, walk up to your units and blow themselves up in order to get the infection forms close to new hosts and weaken them at the same time. Infection forms can turn your units into flood combat forms, 
so they need to be weakened in order for them to do it. It should be noted that only your infantry can be infected. Combat forms are the units that have been infected and retain their weapons that they had. Grunts and Jackals are now able to be infected. The Flood Thrasher form performs similar to the Flood Tank form from Halo 3. While not necessarily something you combat in the FPS games, Flood Spores do appear in Halo Wars, which can also infect your units randomly, though they do peter out eventually. The new Flood forms you face are Flood Swarms, which are the aerial units, as well as the Bomber form, which are also aerial units. Flood Swarms are generally weak, but pack a punch when in large groups, they're especially good against infantry. Flood Bombers play a similar role to carrier forms in a sense that they bring infection forms closer to new hosts, but instead of blowing up, they drop Flood Biomass that explode into infection forms. As for buildings, they have Flood Nests, Flood Dens, and Flood Colony, which all function the same. They spawn units and can be destroyed in a sense, though they can regenerate back when they aren't wiped off with a cleansing beam which is only in story mode. The proto grave mine kind of functions as a building here as well. As for their defenses, they have a launcher, which shoots out flood biomass to damage their target, and sometimes those biomasses turn into spores to infect your units. Now, the other defensive building is the flood root, which is essentially a large tentacle that attacks you. It has limited range, especially compared to the flood launcher. It should be noted that these two, once destroyed, do not regenerate back. The other flood-related things are the flood stalks and the flood eggs. They don't really pose a threat at all unless you destroy them. Once destroyed, they don't regenerate back, but they do summon flood spores in flood infection forms. Flood eggs also give a chance to give you resources which your infantry can pick up. While we're at it, sentinels have three variants. Protector Sentinels Sentinels and Super Sentinels Protector Sentinels themselves have multiple variants to them. When upgrading the Prophet of Regret with Ancestral Perversion, it will give him two offensive Protector Sentinels, which any units can get when playing on the map Labyrinth. The offensive Protector Sentinel attacks enemies within range of those it's attached to. Same goes with the Shield Protector Sentinels, which projects a rechargeable energy shield around those it's attached to. Think of Halo 3 Bubble Shield. The last variant is the Healing Protector Sentinels, which heals those it's attached to when it's out of combat. The Shield Protector Sentinels and the Healing Protector Sentinels don't have a way to attack enemies. It's possible for Spartans to have two Sentinels if they have Protector Sentinels and the vehicle they hijack has Protector Sentinels. Sentinels are what you would fight in the FPS games. While the Super Sentinel is different to the Enforcer in Halo 2, the Super Sentinel doesn't do a lot of damage, but their attacks slow and stop units and buildings from attacking. And the Sentinel is just a light air unit. Overall for the factions, the Covenants can be very good rushes. Well, you want to see Excel late game. Covenants only healing resource is from creating engineers which are single target healing, but you can build multiple at the cost of resources and population count. Vampires have slight healing from its stasis ability, as well as Arbiter's Rage when upgraded to Defiance Rage or above. I guess they also have shields, which will generate over time. UNC has the heal and repair ability, which is on a relatively low cooldown, and Sergeant Forge has Cyclopses, which can heal other Cyclopses, ground vehicles, and structures. Marines can heal themselves outside of combat when upgraded to at least having a Medic. UNC has more ways to disrupt the Covenant with Disruption Bomb and their unique leader power compared to the Covenant's brute force. The Covenant's only way of defeating air-centric team builds is if the Covenant go air themselves. And if you're late to the game on air units, you're gonna have a very tough time taking back the skies, especially if they have vultures. You would need a group of vampires to at least deal with one vulture. The Covenant's uber unit is way stronger than the UNSC's uber unit. UNSC has multiple ways of slowing down the units compared to the Covenant dealing with any uber units. When facing off against higher difficulty AI, more so just automatic 100 to 200, Vampires can take out vultures easily, but they'll get wrecked by the supporting composition of the enemy's army. 
you're more than likely gonna need at least two scarabs to deal with one scarab from the enemy covenant to come out unscathed. Covenant leaders are great, but powers push them around too much. You wanna see has a somewhat unlimited ability to move their troops around multiple times back and forth, while the covenant can move their units to their leader via gravity lift but can also recall their leader. The units can't travel back to their leader though. You wanna see with their passives can give them an edge in terms of map control, either by getting more resources, having less time to upgrade their bases, or spending less in general. The you wanna see has the ability to reduce the speed of unit production while the Covenant do not, as well as movement speed for infantry. The AI in general seems pretty basic. They build an army, they send them to your base with no macros or micros. They linger until you've taken a chunk out of their HP pool and leave. They'll usually send scouts to scout your base and those scouts sometimes collect resources that are littered around the map. But they hardly ever change their buildings when they know what you have. Once they've built their buildings, they'll stick to what they have and never change. And you can counter their units pretty easily. They really take garrisonable buildings that give them bonuses. Unless their scout sees you in one, there's a chance they'll go and take that from you. Otherwise, they're not gonna try it. They seem to have a lack of self-preservation. They send their army to your base, and their last base is in danger. They won't send that army back, though the army would never make it in time if they did. It's just a little weird that they won't try to save themselves at all. Though I guess they have a minute of being baseless until it's truly game over. More times than not, on Legendary and above, they will destroy the closest rebel base to your base and build a base there. After that, they'll hardly go to the other base locations to build other bases. When they do take that base, that's when they'll start diversifying their units. But if you catch them in the act and wipe out the squad that's taking the base and take that base, they'll be severely handicapped. As for smaller maps, they're not likely going to get another base. Sometimes their units will just hide around their base and not do anything at all, which is a little weird. The higher automatic level you go, the stronger the units become, meaning your unupgraded units will get demolished. But at the same time, if you outpopulation count the AI, the more likely you're going to win, which is pretty easy because they essentially play skirmish like people would in deathmatch. The more bases they get, the more they'll diversify and add to their army, though broken up. Because of the massive increase to resource gathering on higher automatic difficulty, if they do get a second base, and the AI you are playing against is Covenant, you're gonna have a really tough time, they'll likely have a Scarab queuing up, and you're likely gonna need at least two Scarabs to deal with one, though it's a lot easier if you're UNSC. There's a weird interaction with Skulls to where it feels like it affects the AI as well, at least for the Skull that increases your resources, as the Covenant will have a Scarab within 10 minutes, plus an army and their leader with Skulls that benefit the player enabled. As for Team AI on Legendary or above, you can ping certain locations on the map and they'll move their units there. There is a chance that they just completely ignore your ping, but same with human players. You're more likely going to get support from your human teammates when your base is getting attacked however. 2v2 with AI, Legendary and above, I seem to have a tougher time than I do with 1v1 and 3v3s with AI. 3v3 teammate AI with what was previously discussed in terms of self-preservation. If you stop the initial attack, then your AI bodies will generally wipe out one of the enemies, making it significantly easier for you. A neat little thing is that sometimes your AI bodies will have extra supplies and you can ping their supply pad and they'll send you some. It's only ever done when the AI advisor option was turned on. While this option might make it feel cheap to use as they'll usually tell you what they're building, it's not very accurate at all. Sometimes they'll say the enemy is building Cobras, except they don't have a vehicle bay, or they'll launch an attack at this base, but that attack happened like 30 seconds ago, or sometimes they won't say anything at all. In terms of accuracy, it's probably along the lines of 30% accurate, 30% inaccurate, and 40% not saying anything. Of course, that statistic is made up, but it's roughly how it feels with a lot of skirmish games in. I wish you had more control over your AI teammates, like how you can boss around your AI teammates in Red Alert 3. As for the game modes in Skirmish, Skirmish is your standard game mode, which uses standard settings in which most of this information came from. Deathmatch has you with very low population to begin with, but you get a lot of resources. That is for a reason. 
The more bases you get, the higher population you get. The max population count you can have is 99. You gain 10 for building a base and you start at 15. You get all the tech research for every unit available to the leader you choose. So you're not going to have grizzlies if you chose anders. It's pretty fun for a more faster paced game. I should also point out that leader abilities in terms of at least UNSC takes time for it to actually come online. Keep away is essentially single flag, capture the flag game mode. But instead of having one team attack another team's base for it, it's on a neutral place to where you destroy the flag carrier and the unit that kills the flag carrier becomes the flag bearer. If that unit gets destroyed, then the flag carrier resets. You have to keep that flag bearer alive to score a point. Tug of War is based on total army strength and buildings. There's a bar that you're essentially playing Tug of War with, hence the name. The more units, unit upgrades, and buildings you obtain, the more points you get. You can lose points for destroyed units and buildings, so that's something to keep in mind. Either team can win without having to destroy any bases. Reinforcements, which gives you random units after a certain period of time. The units are get are randomly given to you, but the way they're chosen is based off of the population counts and the amount of resources you've accumulated. If you're planning on upgrading your units or buildings, it's better to do it before the timer as it'll take all of them. Having little to no resources, however, you'll not be given any units. You can produce units yourself if you so desire. As for skirmish as a whole, there's very limited customization in creating skirmish games. You can't set the amount of resources you start with, you can't change your team color, you can't choose where to choose your starting base locations, you can't choose team count, as in if you wanted to play a 1v5. Basically a lot of customization that Red Alert 3 and StarCraft 2 possess. You're only limited to game type, leader choice for you and the AI, the difficulty for each AI, and map selection. A little disappointing when you're coming from the other RTS games, but enough to get by. The tutorial is simple enough to understand. Well, I've played RTSs in the past, so I know these things. It's still a neat addition to the game for those trying out the genre. Having to actually do the task will most likely stick with you on what to do. My only gripe with it is that when it's telling you which buttons to use, there's a giant pause for it, which you could easily show the button and let them do it at the same time. Small crate icon. One thing they added to the PC version was the creation of groups. Now you can group your units and you can always call upon them with a single press of a button. The group function was on the Xbox version of Red Alert 3 as well as the PC version of that, but it wasn't in the Xbox version of AO Wars. You did have a button to jump between bases as well as armies, which serves as a pseudo group creation but you can't really fine tune it like you can with groups, which is present in the PC version. Other controls I wish they also added was waypoints, to where once they reach where you clicked, they will move on to the next target you clicked on until it's done all you've told it to. This can be very beneficial when scouting and trying to get resources, or even guarding a certain location. That and actual unit orders or behaviors. What I mean by that is force attack order, or hold position or stop immediately, making them not attack at all and so on. Another thing I wish they added. Giving the follow command is also beneficial, especially for engineers, as they'll just fly over to the enemy you selected to attack when they're in a group. Contrast that with StarCraft, to where they'll usually stop when the marines stop. Another thing is that in-game cutscenes can't be skipped, and trying to get into the settings menu immediately after also pauses the game without being able to access menus. It's pretty annoying when you need to do something in the menus, but can't do so because of these. As for the settings, there isn't that much there, even for accessibility settings. It is nice to have separate controls for dialogue volume, which some games don't actually have that option, <coughs> MCC. But for everything else, it's very limited. With its development, it's a surprise that this game even came out. I mentioned Red Alert 3 in StarCraft a lot, which was released somewhat close to Halo Wars. Red Alert 3 both PC and console versions, releasing a few months before the 360 version of Halo Wars, and StarCraft coming out a year later. 
Compared to those games, Halo Wars is definitely slower and with limited units both in population count and the amount of units. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing. For one, this game lacks depth, but that lack of depth makes it easier for people new to the genre to follow along easier. The fact that there's less units means they don't have to have a whole chart written down in order to remember which units count or which units. The slower nature of the game makes it easier to follow. There's no doubt that veterans would want more from them, but seeing as how the game was based off of a franchise known for FPSs, it's more welcoming than, say, an Age of game, with so many units and nations with different units and counter plays. And with a little more time, it would have been interesting to see where this game could have become. Okay, that definitely took a long time. <laughs> Especially when the articles aren't viewable anymore, even in the Wayback Machine, but... <laughs> yeah, sorry this took so long, but... Hopefully you will have a good morning, afternoon, evening, night, whatever time it is for you, and uh, until our paths cross, you legends.